Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to On the Road with Illinois Stories on our trip from Quincy this summer. We got really unlucky with the weather this morning. When we got to Four Winds Farm, our first stop, it was pouring buckets of rain. Everybody on the trip was a good trooper. They got their umbrellas, they hiked their little way up here on the, on the gravel road up to the Learning Center here at Four Winds Farm. And Deborah Lee, who has a PhD in nutrition uh, and grows natural garden things here for, for eating and for medicinal purposes, has a Learning Center upstairs here, which was perfect size for our small group. And they got to learn all about the, uh, the benefits of, of the natural way of growing things here at Four Winds Farm. Um, so even though we didn't get a chance to get outside to enjoy the gardens, we did get a chance to enjoy Four Winds Farm. This is a Centennial Farm. Uh, it looks a lot different than it did quite a few years ago. Uh, I'm the fifth generation owner and I inherited 120 acres and there's 40 acres here and then some more across the road a little bit and up the road. I have a lot of gardens that I've worked on and this building as much as possible is out of recycled materials. The outside is all cedar telephone poles that a friend milled for us. Uh, a lot of this is recycled. The stairs came out of an old barn. And I did a lot of it. Uh, like, I didn't do like the initial. I had a honey that wanted to build this bigger building. And so he started doing it. About the time we got to the siding, I think he realized, oh, this is going to be a pretty big job. So he left. <laughs> so mostly what I do here is I'm a holistic health practitioner. And that means that I encourage people how to claim or reclaim their health. So that's, I just started to garden more and more. And the theme that I have here, because I'm so interested in wild plants, and their medicinal and their edible virtues and just the fact that we can utilize these. This is up until really maybe 50, 60 years ago, this is what people were relying on throughout history. And so when I was leading those wilderness trips and carrying a really heavy backpack, I thought, well, this doesn't make a lot of sense. So that's what got me first interested in so many of them are medicinal. I also have theme gardens. If you do look out here, you'll see like what are those cups doing hanging up in the garden? And what's that white teapot there? Big, what kind is that enamel, I guess, teapot? That's because throughout the gardens I have themes. So that's my tea garden, my peppermint patty tea garden. I have a butterfly garden. I have a shade, shady fairy garden. And I have just a variety of things going on because I just think that's kind of fun and magical. It is still raining really hard when we get to the Lewis Round Barn at the Old Timers facility at the Adams uh, County Fairgrounds. This Lewis Barn, which celebrated its 100th year anniversary just recently, and the print shop and the one-room schoolhouse and the log cabin were all part of the tour here. Now, a lot of people did chose not to go into those outbuildings because it was raining so hard, but a lot of people had a really nice tour of the Lewis Round Barn, 100 years old.
next stop was the Brickman home at Ursa. I call this place collector's paradise, they don't. But I mean, when you see the collection that's in this barn and in their garage, and also Rosie happens to be a very, very uh, gifted gardener. Well, there's no shortage of stuff to see here. Where you get it, and the answer is garage sales, auctions, read the paper, <laughs> pick it up here and there. And uh, uh, it's, it's just uh, been a, a fun thing. I have a toy room right there. I have a St. Louis Cardinals room right there. And then uh, that one, kind of a catch-all. The, there's a uh, farm set in there from 1938, a gentleman made. Uh, as you can see, there's small collectibles over here. I try to deal with a lot of the local stuff. And uh, here, and the, also uh, the basement of the barn is open, but if you, there's steps, there's no, nothing to grab a hold of. If you want to go down there, you're more than welcome to. There's eight stalls down there. And it was a, originally the barn was built in 1932 or three, somewhere along in there. And when, while they were building this barn, the house burnt, so they pulled a crew off the barn to build a house, and then they came back to this. And presumably all this, we were told this lumber was all built off, or harvested off the uh, land across the road. We do own five and a half acres across the road. The old barn is from 1860, something like that. So it's a very, very old one, but it's still. So you're free to roam around if you see something. If you have a question about, feel free to ask. If there's something in the display cases that you'd like to see, I'd be more than happy to pull it out for you. So wander around. Rosie, you, you get to show a lot of people this garden, not just us, don't you? Yeah. There are a lot of people that stop by. In fact, <laughs> we had a couple yesterday that saw your ad, but they she was not physically able to go on your bus tour yeah. because she's had a hip replacement. They're from Rushville. Yeah. They drove up here, went to Ursa, went to the AMVETS and found somebody to bring them out here. They went out I'm here for an so hour. I'm so glad you told me that because I was, I wondered if, yeah, that's, that's, that's yeah. nice to hear. <laughs> they were, they were uh, 87 and 93. And, and you got, they got funny. to see your garden anyway. And the barn. She this wanted is, to see the barn. This is a great time of year because your daylilies yeah. are blooming. Yep. All, all of your early and midsummer stuff is just, is in bloom now, right? Yes. It's a terrific time to come. We're looking at, I think we're looking at coneflowers uh -huh. and is that larkspur mm -hmm. behind it? Yeah. Oh my goodness. And daylilies every place. Yeah. Of course, this wind and all this rain. What, what's, the wind and what's, the rain are pretty hard on things. Yeah. So 
you know, such as it is. You need rain, but maybe you not. You need the rain, but not as much not as we have. Maybe not 10 inches in a month. That's it. And, and boy, I'll tell you, in this trip that we've had today, you know, I mean, we've just been, everybody's had an umbrella yeah. the whole time and yeah. ponchos. So I'm and, glad the sun came out well, for no, the look, garden, I mean, look, least. yeah, they're enjoying themselves. They can get out. They can walk around now. Yeah. That for, and they can they can wander pouring. through your wander through so. your garden, um, but it is challenging, isn't it? it yeah, it's always a challenge because when somebody was mentioning, well, you know, you don't use any mulch, and you say, well, you know, you, you, there's a give and take to everything. Mm -hmm. If you use mulch when it's real rainy, then of course you get way too much moisture, don't right. you? Right. Yeah, and things start to die. So. Yeah. It's a guessing game, yeah. you know, it's farming, so. It is, it's, it is farming without the eating part. That's right, <laughs> yeah, farming with no profit. <laughs> it's, it's, it's nice, it's nice that they, uh, we finally get a chance to get in the sun and, yeah. and get dried out a little bit here today. Yeah, we've had a wet, wet tour. Yes, it is, it's beautiful, thank you. You're welcome. I want to tell you, just before I introduce you to Mike and Marty, I want to tell you a little story. We were here, oh, I don't know, a couple of months ago, I guess, <laughs> and they were showing us how the operation works. And they said, you might want to bring two cameras because we noticed that we had a TV cam, a TV crew in here from the Quad Cities, and they couldn't get their camera. It, it got all fogged up in the shrimp room. It was cold outside. It was warm inside. It took them hours to shoot, so you might as well bring another camera. Okay. Well. We didn't have another camera, so if you saw the Illinois story about this, those of you who saw it, you'll, you'll remember that you kept seeing this wiping the lens as we went. There's Randy. Show him, Randy. How that's what that looks like. About every 15 seconds, Randy's wiping the lens, and then, oh, we're in focus again. And then pretty soon, condensation. Then we're focused. So anyway, that's, that's why that looked that way. And that's why this program is going to look that way, because when we go into the shrimp room, your glasses are going to get fogged up. The camera's going to get fogged up, <laughs> but that's okay. This is Mike. Hi. I'm Mike and, Finley. And, and this is my partner, Marty Douglas. Marty Douglas. Yeah. I guess to start with, how many of you saw the uh, Illinois Stories episode of this? A few. So a few. So, a few. so some of you it's new to. Uh, another question is, how many have had any idea that shrimp are raised in the Midwest? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, actually, at this point, there's four that are active oh. in the state. Okay. So, and it's, there's more more interest. I think there'll be within a year there'll be some more probably. But uh, I guess welcome to the M&M Shrimp Shack. Uh, start with I guess I'll just go briefly over a little bit of the, the history of the the building and the, and the farm. Uh, my family actually bought this property in 1908. Um, the barn itself, which the majority of the barn we tore down approximately 10 years ago and just put a roof over the basement. The original barn was built, they're guessing, in the 1860s, but uh, age had taken its toll on it and just got to where it wasn't really safe to be used anymore, so we tore down the, the upper portion, put a roof over the basement. This is the original foundation, which concrete's 12 inches thick. We don't think it's going to go anywhere. So um, when we get around to our, our office sales lab area, that's was a lean-to on the main part of the barn. We were able to salvage it. It was still structurally sound, and so we kept that part, and, and that's what we got as our office lab area now. The ideal temperature, water temperature for the shrimp is about 84 degrees, and we're raising them year-round, so obviously we've got to keep, keep it warm inside all the time. Um, we decided we didn't want to try to heat it all with LP, so we did a lot of research and kind of came up with several different designs and combined and came up with our own design on this solar panel. Um, it's six foot tall, 42 feet long, and what it does is it pulls air out of the room and passes through here and blows back in on the other side. Um, we're estimating it's, it cut our heating bill in about half last winter. Um, as a comparison, my house is the same square footage and I used twice as much LP on the house keeping it 20 degrees cooler than we did here. So it, uh, I think it's worth its weight in gold over the long term. Yeah. This is uh, our, our high-tech swimming pools. <laughs> Always wanted an indoor pool and now I got eight, so. <laughs> uh, actually, we've got three phases in here. When we get the shrimp, they're, they're shipped overnight, Federal Express, from a hatchery in the Florida Keys. Uh, when we get them, they're about the size of an eyelash. You can just barely see them in the water. They're 11 days old. 
And actually back in that corner is our nursery. There's smaller tanks in there. Uh, they'll stay in there approximately a month and then we'll divide those up and transfer them out into these smaller pools. And they'll stay in here for about two months and then we'll transfer them to the bigger pools for another two months. So it takes roughly five months from the time we get them till the time they're ready to sell. Oh, what did I do with the net? Here we go. Yeah, I can probably see better. This pool is some of our bigger ones at this point. They like to jump. Yeah, they... Everybody told us when we was looking into it how much they jumped until you see it, it's hard to believe, but they can actually clear these nets. They'll, they will at times jump completely out. Oh my God, there's a tie. Yeah, it's a tie. Oh my gosh. You got a lot of legs. They've actually got a little, they call it a horn, it's almost like a little spear right there. That's yeah, one of yeah. their defense mechanisms. Well, for heaven's sake. And then they got another one on their tail. Huh. This is the most common that's raised in this type of system. Um, the tiger shrimp, they don't work very well in, a, in an environment like this. That's, they get, they're the ones that get really big, but they'll, you know, they're mostly just in a natural environment. They are raised some, um, like in Asia and where it's warmer climates and in a natural setting that way. 90% um, of the shrimp in the U.S. is actually imported. Most of it comes from third world countries, Indonesia, Vietnam, China. Here, you know, it's a local fresh product. Uh, you don't have to worry about oil spills. We don't have any tankers or oil wells or anything to worry about, so. Any guesses on how many would be in this pool? <laughs> At this point, we've got about 10,000 in there. Um, it's it's probably a little crowded, um, but they are smaller, so we'll we'll have them thinned out when they get bigger. Um, kind of our design plan is groups of 5,000 all the way through in the pools. So. Our last stop of the day, and the rain did stop this afternoon, was to the Quincy Adams County History Museum, the new museum in the old Gardner Museum of Architecture building. And a lot of the folks here that were from Quincy on this trip hadn't seen this since it was the new museum, so it was a good opportunity. The chandelier that you see up above is from the Tom Jasper. Now that boat is pictured over here on the wall. And the Tom Jasper was built in 1867 for the St. Louis and Quincy Steamboat Company, which had just started that year. And uh, it was going to be the most fancy boat on the upper Mississippi when they built it. Uh, the um, uh, main cabin was pure white. It had gilded trim with the ginger gingerbread down it and the ladies' cabins were done in violet. Uh, the individual stateroom doors uh, were made of rosewood, and they had individual oval scenes of uh, pan-painted on there. 
of a bucolic scene like a waterfall or a stream or something. Um, but anyway, the, the, the chandelier is made of French drop lead crystal uh, and was the most fancy on, on the uh, Mississippi River. Uh, over here, uh, pictures of Dubuque. These are two uh, of the crew members of the Dubuque. The man on the right is the captain, Captain Con McGee. And uh, the Dubuque is right above there. It's from about 18, or excuse me, 1907 or so. And here's the Quincy over here and the main cabin. You can see it's, it's set up to eat and then there are cabin doors on either side. That's, those are the stateroom cabins. And in this autograph book that you see right here is actually reproduced there and it shows individual scenes. It shows how the cabins are laid out here on either side of the main cabin for uh, both the Quincy and the uh, 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 Dubuque. And uh, it, uh, has an individual cabin room here. So you can see what that looked like with the beds and so forth. Uh, then uh, the pilot wheel over here was a, a steamboat called the Jeannie Deans. And the first packet company on the Mississippi or on the, any of the rivers really was uh, put up in 1844 by um, uh, John McCune of St. Louis. And he got three boats together, or three captains together, and they both owned their boats, all of them, and they pooled their interest and they um, worked together and each of them could make a trip up and down between, Keo uh, between St. Louis and Keokuk twice a week. So they had uh, a, a boat that would be in each town at the same time every week, uh, every day, uh, for six days a week. And nobody had ever done that before. Before they just waited until the boat got full. So he was the old reliable is what they called it. But uh, this, is, this is from the second group of boats that he had called the Genie Deans and it was built in 1852. Uh, only lasted a few years. Then this over here is a slot machine. It's one of the early slot machines. Uh, the slot machine was invented in 1898 by Charles Fay in, Saint, in uh, San Francisco. And this particular one was made in Chicago by the Mills Company in 1900. Now the steamboats that you see up here, uh, the top one, uh, was the city of St. Louis and it came here in 19, uh, uh, 1903 uh, to give ex excursions and it was a bigger boat than was supposed to be up in this area uh, and it um, got into some trouble and hit three boats on three different occasions in the, in the um, uh, bay, backing out of the bay. Um, and uh, two of the times it hit, it hit the People's Ferry, which is owned by Clad Adams, who was a local boat store owner here and had a ferry service to go across the river. And to pay him back uh, for the damage done to his boat, they gave him two slot machines, which is this one, and $30. So this is one of the oldest slot machines. The center in here would have looked like a wheel of fortune. You can see in that image up there on the wall, that was what it would have originally looked like. And you would have had a crank here that you would have turned once you dropped your money in. And then all the receipts would have come down here. Then uh, over here, this is from our a railroad station that was built. Um, it started in 1898 and finished in 1899. And um, you see the tower was built. It was built on the Gothic and Roman styles. You see all the arches were on the interior as well as the exterior arches. That's the Roman influence. Uh, and then the uh, Gothic influence is going to be the stone that you see here. This was on some of the corners and so forth. And uh, kind of a gargoyle looking thing. But this is actually an image of Mercury, I believe. Uh, but on top of the bell tower, and it's a 147 foot tower, was this uh, weather vane made of copper that was made in the Galesburg shop uh, of the CB and Q Railroad. Uh, and uh, it's been preserved. Well, now we actually have something to complain about, the heat. No, actually, all day we've been out, all morning anyway, out in this fierce driving rain, and it sort of kept us inside. We wanted to be outside, but it's been a great day on the road with Illinois Stories. Thanks for watching. Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you. For a DVD copy of the program you've just seen, send 1995 to Network Knowledge, P.O. Box 6248, Springfield, Illinois 62708. 
Be sure to include the program name, subject, and when the program aired. You can also order with your credit card by calling 800-232-3605.